by the mellow sounds of Thelonious Monk, we are comfortably zoned. Alameda, California, I am the Zigzag Man. 420 Studios in Alameda, California. And when Thelonious plays Blue Monk in the background, we are always blessed to have Brother Scott in studio. Hey, Scott. Hey, hey. Hey, Scott is going to do something for me which I need doing, and that's demystify not only Korea, the uh, Korean situation, but give us a little update, Scott, if you would, on what brought things to what they are now with Korea, and uh, I'll let you add it. Thanks. Um I got to start out by saying Korea is still a mystery to me because it's hard to find very much information on Korea uh, of at least credible quality. There's a whole lot out of a whole lot of drivel out there and a whole lot of scandal type stories with Dennis Rodman and whatnot, but not very much of credible quality having to do with the history and dynamics of Korea, the United States, Japan, China, and so on. It's harder to find, let's put it that way. But I did a little research because the topic's been in the news. I don't know very much. And they say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But here's what little I've discovered. And the listener can make up his or her own mind how they feel about it. I start with this premise. If you want to take an objective look at what's going on in Korea, both internally and in foreign relations, you have to set aside and work hard to set aside just about everything you've heard up to now, if you've been following it in the media. Because as it so often does, the media, the mainstream media at least, likes to focus very much on the scandals and uh, the atrocities and uh, the killings and, and stuff that's newsworthy no doubt but doesn't really go very far in explaining very much about what's gone on with Korea if you take the long view which is in the long run the most comprehensive view um, you realize that Korea has for a long time been sandwiched between greater powers than itself China and Japan and to a lesser extent Russia, have cast long shadows over the Korean Peninsula. And the Korean Peninsula, for centuries, has been a stepping stone on the way to an invasion of the Asian mainland through Manchuria, uh, that region of northeastern modern-day China that um, has a lot of industry, industry and is a very important region. That region was, for instance, coveted by Imperial Japan and Imperial Japan occupied it and annexed it directly between 1910 and 1945. For 35 years they pretty much ran the show. Uh, they did actually train some Koreans and Chinese to work for them both in a civilian capacity and in a military capacity and that will uh, have a significant impact later on in the development of modern-day Korean Peninsula, the post-World War II Korean Peninsula. But we'll get to that later. The main thing that I'm impressed by when I, when I took a glance, really, and no more than a glance, at the history of the Korean Peninsula was that how hardy uh, the identity of the Koreans is, is how sturdy it is. They've, they've been batted around and uh, foreigners have, been, have marched up and down the Korean Peninsula half a dozen times or more in the last couple of thousand years. And these include uh, the Chinese, the Manchus, the Mongols, the Japanese, and then in the 19th century and, and uh, since, that's included the English, the French, the Americans, and um, the Koreans have had to struggle hard to preserve a sense of national identity and especially national independence. So in Korea, heroes are made by championing the national independence of that peninsula. Um, 
I, and I start with that, that that feeling of national identity is very strong. Uh, and uh, if you're seen as somebody who collaborated with the foreign occupation power, like the Japanese or the Manchus or the Mongols, you're just you're you're not held in high esteem for that. People uh, are mistrustful of you if that's the kind of person you are. Uh, so I start with that, and then I also s try to emphasize that we um, the the dynamics of the cult of personality that exists in North Korea, especially, but is not entirely absent in South Korea either, uh, has a long history a centuries-long history, going back to what historians traditionally called Oriental despotism. They said that with a certain arrogance because despotism, that is uh, absolute power in a single person, a despot, um, and sometimes taking the extreme form of adoration and worship of the despot, has a long tradition in the history of the West as well. Um, so I disregard most uh, references to that as being peculiar to Korea. It's not. It's not even peculiar to Asia. But it has a very long, a centuries long history. Uh, we've heard stories, people my age and, and older, heard stories of Japanese soldiers, for instance, who were so loyal to the emperor that after World War II they remained hidden in the jungles in the Pacific Isles and came out sometimes decades later after the war was officially over of uh, pilots from the Japanese Imperial Air Force who flew their bomb-laden planes into uh, American and English and French uh, Navy ships and tried to destroy them and immolating themselves in the process. You hear all kinds of things that sound very lurid but they are only as uh, important, um, they're only as abnormal as they were in the West when they were routinely practiced here. Um, the medieval times when the church and the state were one, often referred to as the Dark Ages, uh, saw... Last Thursday! <laughs> <laughs> saw, saw all kinds of funny stuff going on. Um, and, and the, those who follow the Vicar of Christ, who sits on the throne of St. Peter today in Rome, the billion or so professing Catholics and other Christians who uh, worship and adore uh, a semi-deified human being as their um, font of all wisdom and everything good, need to check themselves before they go wagging their fingers at the Koreans who refer to the Kim Jong-il as the dear leader and his father as some other Akolod of even greater proportions and the grandfather who started the three generation dynasty of the Kims in North Korea is, is almost deified but that's not peculiar to Korea that's my point so to understand Korea disregard most of that um, you can look elsewhere and find it too it doesn't explain it explains about as much about Korea as uh, as uh, religious beliefs in the West explain about that area. I'm not saying they don't have any impact at all, but they're not peculiar in the sense that um, one civilization or culture has it and one civilization or culture does not. That sort of behavior and that kind of thinking is age old. It's just that most of the rest of the world gave it up after 1776. And the Kim family seems to be trying to reintroduce it in the Korean Peninsula. And there are certain forces in the West that never want to let it go. And they know who they are. Beautiful, Scott. Man, you just hit it right. It hit the nail right on the head. As usual, it is a pleasure having you. Um, this is... Um, sunny california so wherever you are it ain't like it is out here uh will you agree on that you grew up in columbus it's wet and cold in columbus right now right now all right and we got it pretty good and we ain't complaining nice hanging with you at the uh 420 
And I'm going to close out as I generally do. I want to uh, implore you to keep your dreams wet and your humor dry. Keep your kids away from clerics who wear dresses. It's never good. Keep them off the laps of those folks. And keep your kids out of recruiting stations, military recruiting station. The kid will walk in as you know your child today and walk out a different person maybe five, six years later, maybe four years later, God forbid, maybe sooner. Um, it's bad. War is evil. We all contribute. Let's stop it. We've done it for generations. Thank you, Scott. Always great. All right. Be seeing you. All right. Adios, everybody. Over and out.